Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 344, featuring the first in a new series of interviews with Mr. Mike Whitmer, the author of Empire of Imagination, Gary Gygax, and the Birth of Dungeons and Dragons. Now you probably know a little bit about Gary Gygax, but I bet you don't know all the really awesome stories uh, that Mike tells in this book about him. Uh, we also learn about, of course, the creation of the game, all the controversies surrounding it, the impact that it had, and uh, this new edition has a... It just came out has a foreword by John Romero who talks a bit about the impact that it had on computer games. Not just computer role-playing games, but computer games like Doom. Anyway, there's a lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Mike Whitwer. Hi folks, I am here with Mike Whitwer. He is the author of this book here, Empire of Imagination, Gary Gygax and the Birth of Dungeons and Dragons. It's a fantastic book, tells you everything you ever wanted to know about uh, Gary Gygax, and if you think, he, if you're not interested in, in him as a person, just give this book a chance. I think you'll be really uh, surprised. Of course, it also talks about the uh, the game Dungeons and Dragons and the how that game came about and the controversies and uh, the impact. And we'll get great stuff that we'll get into in this episode. So, how are you doing today, Mike? I am great today, uh, Matt. Thank you for having me. I'm actually a big fan of yours, so I'm thrilled to be on the show today. Uh, thrilled to have you. Uh, now, one of the things I you'll notice right away about this book, it's uh, definitely not a sort of boring, you know, fact, list of facts and dates and names and dates sort of approach. Instead, we've got uh, what I'd kind of call a creative nonfiction. You think it's a bit too much to call it that? Mm -mm. No, I, I would say that's exactly uh, narrative nonfiction. Creative nonfiction is exactly where it fits uh, from a genre standpoint. Um you know, it's, it's funny you mention that because I'm, I'm actually I'm glad to hear that because um, my biggest goal was I wanted to make sure it really read. I wanted to make sure that um, let me put it this way: there's been a lot of really really good books about gaming history out there in the last couple of years. Um, uh, you had John Peterson's Playing at the World, which was was masterful. I mean, it's really kind of the textbook of of the gaming history. I know while it doesn't focus uh, specifically on Gygax, nothing actually does other than my book. Um, it you know obviously talks a lot about Gygax and really the, the official history, and then you get into uh, Shannon Appleclient's books, uh, Designers and Dragons, I believe it is. Um, yeah, and it's a whole series of four books, and th those are those are great. Those are really have to do with the gaming industry, uh, the role playing game industry. But for my purposes, um, you know, this was first and foremost, it was a book about Gary Gygax. It was the the guy that that founded this this, uh, or I should say, co-founded to be exact, this entire um, the genre of games. Uh, and his life, and, and what was it about this guy that really inspired this innovation, that, and this, this incredible movement that, of course, turned into much bigger and better things, as, as I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so there was that element of who, who was this guy. Uh, but the bigger part in terms of stylistically for me was um, when I first started writing the book, I was writing it in two different uh, manners. One was kind of a traditional nonfiction approach. That was very much the facts and figures and all that stuff. And then the other approach was this very narrative nonfiction style, where really you're kind of a fly on the wall, or in some cases you're right there with Gary, maybe in his head, um, going through these experiences, which really are contextually very based in fact. I went to a whole lot of trouble to make sure that I could be as accurate as possible in every given scene, every given moment. But the thing that occurred to me was, well, this is a biography, so this is somebody who wants to know about Gary Gygax. Um, the reason I chose this style and why I actually abandoned the traditional nonfiction approach was I wanted the reader to really experience these things with Gary, to actually get a sense of his life and his personality. Because I thought, well, if, if they really want to get to know Gary, how better to know him than to experience the stuff he went through with him? So while you'd have to take some creative license to do that, I couldn't think of a better way to really make people uh, agonize over Gary's defeats with him and also uh, kind of... Um, experiences triumphs with them other than to really kind of make them a fly in the wall and and to do a little bit of extrapolation um so what i've been pleased with is that that for the most part gamers have loved the approach they really are feeling the narrative with gary and that was the whole intention in the first place and i feel like at least my hope is that people actually get a better sense of the man 
by going through these things versus reading a bunch of facts about him. They know a lot about him, but they don't know him. Yeah, I mean, you can go to Wikipedia. <laughs> I like to tell right. people, if you just right. want that, you know, that you can go to it's, it's there. Uh, but, you know, actually, I was reading your book alongside, uh, believe it or not, Herodotus. <laughs> That's good company. Look at that. You know, the, sort of the father, people, some people call him the father of history. Some people call him the father of lies, right? And, uh, like, a lot of the criticisms he gets is, well, he couldn't. How could he have known this? He's got this this sort of dialogue going on between these characters. Nobody else would have been there, that sort of thing. But I mean, of course, as people will point out, well, he's trying to impart lessons, I guess, or teach morals, not just uh, the facts. So, you know, would you say? Uh, I was thinking about with your book, with your uh, work on uh, Gygax. What are there sort of moral lessons that we can get from this book and reading about him? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think the first moral lesson I think we would all agree on with Dungeons & Dragons is the game is very dangerous from both a psychological standpoint and a satanic standpoint, right? We can all agree that the game is... <laughs> sorry, I'm kidding. I have to. Um, no, I, I mean, the moral... I would say... I mean, I try not to be heavy-handed with... Um, I try to be not heavy-handed with really kind of extrapolating about, oh, well, Gary was an insurance outer writer, and that's what made him so great with numbers. Like, a lot of that stuff is not quite right. It sounds like it makes sense. Um, I was really more interested in telling the narrative because I thought the story by itself didn't need to be... Um, I didn't need to make all these great connections and all this stuff. I mean, you know, near the end of the book, as, as you know, I went to a lot of trouble to kind of connect all the dots about why this person is so important, why we might tell this story. But for the purposes of Gary, I thought, well, gosh, it's this unbelievable story. Just tell it like it is. Rags to riches to rags story in his personal life, right? This really interesting personal life with paranormal experiences and, and the, the whole gamut of things. All the way through the dysfunction of TSR, the company that produced D&D, right? That's, that story by itself is like as good as Apple or Facebook, right? And then you pair uh, on top of it all this psychological dangers and all of these controversies that sparked around the game. And there's, there's no real precedent for that, at least in the in the RPG space, of course, like Doom and other games later encountered some of those same types of uh, nervous mothers and things like that that were that were you know hell bent against the games. But I thought that what a what a great three pronged story we've got here. Um, and I thought Gary being the core of that made it so much more interesting. So I guess to to answer your question, um, I wasn't all that interested in kind of tying together moral lessons and things like that as much as I was really just trying to tell the story of this guy. And I thought the lessons became very clear almost as you read them, like Gary's life does tell a great, there's a great lesson there in the big picture. I think there's a number of them. Um, and I think Gary would have, uh, Gary later in his life did talk a lot about a lot of, of them. I bought the fact that I think he, um, you know, neglected some things at home uh, in favor of gaming and developing games. I mean, the guy had five kids in the first 10 years of his marriage. Yeah. He was busy. There was a lot going on here. But I thought um, it, at the end of the day, I think he really came a long way as a, as a character, if you will, a tremendous character arc, and I thought that was just tremendously. I agree with that. With that more, you know, as I was reading the book, I felt okay. I'm sort of getting a, a handle on this Gygax guy now. You read a little bit further on, whoa, you know, I didn't see that coming. Right. <laughs> yeah, and this character is just it's more complex as you go along. Almost, I guess almost like the game itself. <laughs> right. Right. He's a really interesting guy on so many levels, and and that's what really struck me about him. That's what really got my juices flowing. Uh, on Gary Gygax, when I first uh, came up with the idea to do it then as a master's project at the University of Chicago, my, the, the thought was, you know, that, uh, well, firstly, I had written an article about him, and I thought it was just a really interesting kind of, it was an article that was written after he, he had passed away, and um, it, was, it was fairly comprehensive, and it kind of covered this idea that, you know, it talks a little bit more about his personal life, and I thought, wow, what an interesting life this guy had, and that's when I looked for a biography on him, and I couldn't find one. And that's when I thought I would do it as a master's project. So I thought, I can't believe nobody's done a bio on this guy that's created this, this big thing, at least in, in the way I looked at it, uh, having grown up playing games. Um, so that's what really got my juices flowing on it. And I just thought his personal life was so interesting, or at least it sounded so interesting. And then I knew there was all this other great stuff around the game, around the company, around the controversy. And I thought, this is too good of a story not to tell. One of the things I liked about the book is the way you sort of weave in the Dungeons and Dragons experience into the I guess you'd say into the structure of the book, literally, with those sort of prefaces or what what do you call those uh, little segues uh, they're, into the they're like little vignettes that open up each new um what we call levels in the book, right? We've got we've got nine different levels 
but uh, we open up with these these little vignettes uh, of Sir Egery, right, Sir E. Gary, uh, and a dungeon master going through uh, an in-game uh, experience. So we've got the dungeon master describing what Sir uh, Egery sees, and Egery goes, you know, and he make he declares his actions and does all of his stuff. And of course, these little vignettes are fo- uh, they're foreshadowing for the next level. Uh, each level has several chapters, little chapters in it, plus one, plus two, so on and so forth. So uh, that's how we, we did it. But thank you. I, I really um, felt very strongly about it. It would be fun to at least tie something together in terms of foreshadowing that that was really going to tell, tell you a little bit about what happens in this chapter in an in-game type of thing. Yeah, that was a brilliant idea. I mean, some, some, sometimes I'd read those and it wouldn't be clear to me until after I'd finished the chapters. You know, and think, Oh, now I see. You know, now that all makes sense. I mean, that, it's fun to read something like that and put those pieces together. No, thank you. I, I really, it, it's been, um, it, it was a very organic process. Like it, it, a lot of this stuff kind of, well, like anything, I mean, you've written uh, several books yourself, so you know, you um, you have ideas about what you want to do, but, you know, A, the research takes you in a lot of different zigzags. problem is I have those ideas after the book is out. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, why didn't I do it all? Well, it, so to your point, actually, um, I believe I had those vignettes early on, but in terms of the greater structure, I didn't figure that out till fairly late in the editorial process with the editor. Um, in terms of doing, dividing those up with levels and leading those off with little levels, and then doing the plus one, plus two type thing, and I, you know, so there was a lot of that stuff that kind of came up later. Um, so yeah, as you know, it's it's a very organic process, and sometimes your best ideas come well after the book is out. So what do you do? Another thing I. Nice little homage too. Is I is it in the new one, the the map, or is that just in the? Uh... Oh yeah, so it's it's in both. So yeah, it, it is in the new one, Matt. It's um. Is this one? Yeah, this one has this this sort of a really cool map of the city of Lake Geneva. I I love that. Is it you know, in, and I, I will say too? thank you. I, you know, I will say so. It, it's black and white in the paperback, so we had to put it across two pages because we couldn't do. The, uh, we couldn't do the end papers in the paperback because of the nature of, of paperbacks. Um, so, yeah, it's on the first three or four pages in there. So it's actually a two-scale map, believe it or not. It's, um, it's excuse me, uh, done by Steve Sullivan, who did a lot of the original Dragonlance maps. There it is. Um, oh, well, no way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Steve Sullivan was one of the How early cool is that? artists. And so uh, I, I knew him through a friend, uh, through Paul Stormberg, actually, who was one of my research consultants. And uh, he hooked me up with him. And so what we decided to do is like that, well, wouldn't it be cool uh, if we did this role-playing map for the end papers? Because, of course, end papers are something you'll see in history books and a lot of other things and certainly big in the gaming world. And we thought, well, if we put it as the end paper, like those original late 70s modules, and we'll do it in this light blue color, which, with, which they used to call Xerox blue in these days because TSR actually used a certain, um, some type of ink technology that was not, it could not be Xeroxed. So it's called Xerox Blue, and the reason those maps all look the way they do is because uh, they were meant to be photocopy proof. And so we uh, thought, th- this is not, in fact, photocopy proof, but we thought we would, it would be an homage to that by doing it in the blue color and making it to scale and looking like an old D&D map. And, to, and, and with some street addresses, if you ever want to go and see these, these things, they're actually in there. So I definitely want to come back to this whole copyright issues later on. i got some got sure. whole topic on that, but... Uh, but anyway, just just about maps, you know, because it's something I've thought a lot about, and I wrote th- thought about it a little bit too in the uh, Dungeons and Desktops book. It seems like all these games, there's always some kind of map, and this idea of exploring it and filling in uh, the map, and I guess that goes back to D and D. It's in, you see it in the earliest games too. I was thinking about the Colossal Cave Adventure. Oh yeah, yeah. Right. That that guy was a professional caver. Mm-hmm. And I was reading uh, in your book, you talked about how Gary did a lot of this sort of, uh, I think you called it urban exploration. I don't know if he, it seemed like he, there was a cave that he looked. Oh, well, there was, was there a, a cave? Uh, I don't remember. I mean, so his childhood's very, um, I, I kind of described it as Rockwell-esque. It, it kind of is. It's, you know, it's this small resort town, very Tony resort town, actually, in, in, in uh, Wisconsin, Lake Geneva, which you, I'm sure you know. And, um, and so, but it's a really interesting place because it has a small full-time population. In the summer, all these rich Chicago executives come in town and live in these huge mansions on the lake. And um, it's very beautiful and idyllic and all that, but it also has this very small town feel. And of course, it's a lot of hunting in the woods, and of course, the fishing there is great and all that stuff. But there's also all these old sanitariums and big old Victorian houses and stuff in town. And the most notable was 
this this one on the hill called uh, Oakwood Sanitarium. And Oakwood Sanitarium was on the top, the highest point in Lake Geneva, on the top of Catholic Hill, they called it. And it's called Catholic Hill because there's a church across the street. And um, I mean, it's out of a it's out of a horror film. It's out of a Vincent Price horror film. It it, it was this kind of Romanesque, Gothic-ish looking five story building. And it, by the time Gary was a little kid, it was abandoned. And so, I mean, I, I've got pictures of this thing. You got to see it. It's it's unbelievable. So you you couldn't even make this thing up. So it was a rite of passage for kids in those days in Lake Geneva to go wandering around not only the building itself, the building proper, but also the steam tunnels underneath. And this is where it gets interesting, is because it has these. I don't know if they're called steam tunnels. They were they were like laundry tunnels. I'm I'm kind of thinking a little bit more of Egbert here, but steam slash laundry tunnels underneath this this building. And um and what makes it a little bit more interesting is that this is also where holding cells were. So you can imagine being a kid in Lake Geneva in the, in the 40s and the 50s, and you're going around this abandoned uh, insane asylum, you know, and you go into the basement, right, and you're finding manacles on the wall and things like that. And this is, I mean, this are, these are some of the seeds of D&D. I think it's so interesting. This is a place that he would go to frequently, uh, and this is the kind of stuff he was doing. So um, to a certain extent, kind of... Uh, going in these maze-like labyrinths was something very natural for Gary as a kid as a result of this place and a lot of other things he would do. I mean, I think mapping and the whole concept of topography in the town, like it, this is something that was very much on his mind, I think. He was very interested in all this stuff. And of course, maps have a huge role to play in the war games uh, that he was into as well. Those are probably even more map-based than the... It's almost, would you, and, I don't think about Dungeons and Dragons is almost like, okay, we're going to go into the map now. <laughs> Whereas the word Absolutely. game is like you think, sort of got this map spread out in front of you, right? I think you've got it exactly right. I think I, I think it was really fostered with war games in his case. Obviously, he got really into Gettysburg in the late fifties. Um, you know, but then again, it, it really was about um, that was a major jump, right? Getting from the table into the character, and uh, he was of course huge into war games, which was very map based, as you suggest. But then there's also the miniatures aspect, right? Where they're playing on, on large sand tables, which aren't in fact maps, right? They're they're really just little, almost like train sets. They're little recreation miniature terrains where they're 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 using other mechanics to to play what are in effect war games, but they're with miniatures, right? They might use Fletcher Pat, Pat, Pratt rules where they're they're measuring uh, movement and measuring uh, kind of hit um, the ability to hit and so on and so forth. Um, but again, that's what gets really interesting is that you you've got all of this stuff they're into, but the huge jump, of course, is when you take it from the tabletop into actually kind of embodying a character, actually start declaring actions for a single character. That's a major departure. And that is something that really Dave Arneson, more than anybody else, brings to the table. That was, was his biggest contribution was, well, he had many big contributions, but one of which was really making that huge shift from the tabletop where you're playing miniature games to something that's happening all of a sudden in your mind. All right, so Mike, this new edition, or this edition here has a new forward it by, does. Uh, John Romero, who's pretty well known to the people that watch this show. Uh, yeah, John Romero. Um, uh, yeah, he um, uh, he's a fan of the book, and he um, I, it was really important to me. I really wanted to do it with the hardcover, Matt, but as you know, the way these things roll out, you, um, you do your best to get everything you want into them, and sometimes the timing doesn't work out. As you know, you have to be months ahead of where anyone thinks you need to be to actually get everything in there, right? You know, people talk to you six months before and they say, oh, can we get, you know, can we make this change? And you say, dude, I turned in my final manuscript, you know, two months ago. Uh, so, so things like forward are the things that, that we, we couldn't get done for the hardcover. So like anything else, it's kind of a catch-22. The hardcover did really well. And uh, we were able to get a lot of support for the book. And John Romero is someone we were able to get in touch with and ask to, uh, to write a forward. And the reason I really wanted him is because uh, there's a lot of, you know, there's a number of people like Romero. I mean, I think... Um, well, certainly, I mean, you would know the list as well as anybody. I really wanted somebody that was, was foundational in the video gaming world, whether it be first-person shooters or MMOs um, or computer role-playing games, someone that, that really was that really personifies what I'm talking about in the whole last section of the book, yeah. which is that, you know, Gary is bigger than the sum of his parts. He's, the, you know, the, the biggest reason that, that Gary is, is probably so important today is by the transitive property. So many of these things that he laid the foundations for – became some of the biggest pop culture phenomena today, right? Whether it be massively multiplayer online role-playing games or computer role-playing games or even elements of social media, some of these things that used to be unique to the tabletop and to the character creation process of tabletop role-playing 
have really become very pervasive today. So I wanted somebody that that could tell a story that really tied everything together in a really neat sort of way. And I thought Romero would be a perfect person for it because I don't think the connection between first person shooters and D and D is that obvious, actually. And he makes it up more obvious. Yeah. So my reaction to that was at first, okay, John Romero is cool and all, but you know, I, I was some sort of why him? You know, why not Lord British or somebody like that? But you know, after I right. read the forward, it became uh, really clear to me why he was a good choice. You know, not just because, you know, he talks in there about, they. I guess they played a lot of D&D. You know, it did. He talks about John Carmack, which really surprised me. I guess Carmack was the dungeon master. And he Go had this, uh, this campaign with all these politics and intrigue. I mean, this is the same guy. As, what, what do you say? Something like uh, stories and games or like stories and porn, you know, something like right. you know, that. Right. You know, he seemed very negative, sort of had an antipathy about it. Right. But apparently he wasn't like that at all with the <laughs> D&D. You would have expected Romero to be like the DM in their in their case. Like you would have not expected that. I totally agree with you. It's not what we know necessarily of Carmack. Uh, yeah, but there seems to be a kind of a symmetry, and I'm trying to wrap my head around this. Maybe you can help help out. Maybe I'm just uh, having some kind of delusion here. <laughs> uh, but I was thinking about what Gary and uh, Dave Arneson and with Dungeons and Dragons and and how that changed sort of the the gamer culture at that time. You know, which was going from war games, which I, I think it's safe to say was a very nerdy, <laughs> esoteric sort of pursuit, to something like D and D, which was, I mean, still nerdy, but <laughs> I mean, a huge, huge sort of national pastime, international right. uh, pastime. And uh, would you say, would you go so far as to say it sort of did a similar move, right, with the Wolfenstein 3D and Doom? They, the computer games, of course, had been around, but uh, I, I think it's probably safe to say that Doom. In particular, was probably as big as, as, for, as probably as big for computer games, at least for PC games, as uh, Dungeons and Dragons was for the those tabletop war games. Uh. <laughs> I, I, no, I'm 100 percent with you. I mean, I consider Doom, well, Wolfenstein to be exact, but really Doom kind of created the first person shooter market. And again, I mean, you're the expert on this, certainly not me, but um, so absolutely, that was the other big reason about wow, getting somebody that was involved with creating Doom. Uh, I mean, there was two big things. It was it was not only did it do as much for computer because the, the, that's the biggest that's the biggest section of the gaming market out there, to my knowledge, these days is first person shooter or something related to it. As you know, those have melded with role playing games now. Now you've got things like Destiny, which are first person shooter role playing type scenarios, right? So I wanted somebody that was the ground floor of that, and then the added layer, which um, I don't know that he I don't, I don't think he really covers it very much in the forward, but this idea that th- this is the only group that that really went through the things that D and D did in terms of controversy. Hmm. I can't think of another game of in our at yeah. least in the last. Uh, yeah, I mean, th- th- when after Columbine happened, they were under the exact same type of scrutiny that D and D was under. Of course, starting with the Egbert incident in 1979, moving through all of this satanic panic nonsense, um, you know, and and the stuff that that um, that you know Doom and, and Quake and all those games went through. Again, it's a very similar narrative. So I thought, wow. And, and as a matter of fact, I've, I've read, and again, this is a bit of speculation, but um, I have read that, that, that the, the scrutiny that went on the games, uh, games like Quake and Doom at that point, is what actually removed a lot of the scrutiny from games like Dungeons and Dragons, which I think is a very interesting thought, that the focus just shifted to stuff like that. And people said, oh, D&D, that's just, that's fine. Don't worry about that stuff. It's all about these, these new games. Yeah, that is interesting. Because, I mean, at one point you had said, or I don't know, it was your comment. I think you were quoting somebody else, but they were saying that some of these later editions seem to be making the game more mom friendly, <laughs> quote unquote. Which really, that to me, I remember growing up with these things and seeing some of the, uh, well, maybe something like Ravenloft, mm-hmm. and there was a couple other ones. Uh, it wasn't Vampire the Masquerade, I think. Mm-hmm. You know, some of these other games, thinking, wow, so this really is sort of satanic. <laughs> Why isn't anybody making a big deal about this? You know. I mean, this. I mean, the stuff they were making a big deal about back in what I guess the early '80s. I mean, this is nothing compared to. Oh, know. it's tame. It was totally. Yeah. You've got it totally, totally right. G rated. Oh, totally right. I mean, and especially especially now, you can find stuff that's really out there. But even as early as the uh, early '90s, you were finding stuff that was really pushing the envelope. And it's funny. It was a reaction, I think, to the fact that second edition, that's exactly what you're talking about, is that the mom-friendly thing came in when they were working on second edition, and Gary by this time has been ousted, but the company was under tremendous pressure 
uh, due to all of this controversy, because because you know the the D and D controversy really lived throughout the eighties. I mean, eighty five is when the the the, the infamous sixty minutes uh, uh, episode aired, and uh, really th- this stuff carried through the eighties. All this controversy and satanic panic, and um, so D- TSR was under a lot of pressure to make sure to clean up the game and to make sure that it wasn't. Um, yeah, well, that it was more mom friendly. That's exactly what they were trying to do. I think Jim Ward himself, who was really kind of leading the design effort at that point, uh, said that exactly. I think those those words actually came out of his mouth. There's something very similar to it that they were trying to clean it up. Gary didn't love that approach at all, but as a result, they did lose a lot of their core fandom who really liked how raw the game was earlier. And so then it left room in the market for a lot of other games that came out, uh, like Vampire the Masquerade and a lot of other things that. Um, really gave them more of the the hardcore stuff they were looking for that that used to kind of exist in the late seventies, early eighties stuff. I always wondered about that. I mean, as a kid, I always wanted to be the paladin, you know, the goody two shoes types. Right. But I guess there must have been kids out there or older older guys, I guess, that really wanted to be this chaotic evil, you know. Well, I mean, totally. no, they were absolutely. I would say a lot of there was a lot of drive I think for um, like characters like the assassin class, which is I think one that they removed in second edition. There's a good example because yeah, the assassin class by nature I think needs to be I don't remember exactly what alignment they need to be, but it, it's something on the on the evil spectrum, safe to say. So yeah, they they took out some stuff that people really liked doing, if for no other reason that it was it's just cool to be an assassin, I guess, right? <laughs> like you're kind of. I can't imagine how how mom you know come back to that metaphor might have been. <laughs> a little concerned you know with, with something like that or i guess with some of the more darker sides of the uh like the vampire stuff maybe or the well you know and i i have to say matt i i'm with you that i was i always i never had interest in playing anything other than like good characters um you know in fact i, I remember um there was an article i think something that that brian bloom uh who was of course one of gary's uh partners the majority partner uh, wrote in Dragon Magazine somewhere in the, I don't know, maybe late 70s, talking about, like, I don't I don't really get why you would be an evil alignment or an evil character because fundamentally it's a cooperative game. If you're, if you're like, not cool, then the game doesn't work because you can't play nice in the sandbox with your group. And there was something in that. Like, I think there is something legitimately, like, if you're all kind of, of you know, on the evil spectrum, you by nature aren't, if you're actually following that alignment as a character, you're not going to play nice in the sandbox with these other characters. So I, I don't know, there's something really, I do think it's, it, it is built generally for, for good alignments or neutral on up, I guess you could say. Um, but yeah, it's really interesting that it really opened the door to any number of things. I mean, like you think about it's kind of taking it to its logical conclusion, think about games like Grand Theft Auto way down the road in the, in the, the computer, in the, uh, the console gaming world. And, and you see that, People, for whatever reason, for better or for worse, don't always want to play the good guy. They I mean, just it just makes me wonder if I'm glad to hear you say you like to play the good, the good guys too. Because I'm wondering, I mean, were, were, that, were that just like this hopeless goody two shoes type, and everybody else was playing these murdering bastards? And... <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I, I killed the princess. Say, you know, <laughs> you are not the only one. But I will tell you that every time I hear a story about gaming at TSR, I mean, almost without like almost without exception, every game I ever hear about at TSR is a bunch of backstabbing mercenary nonsense. I mean, like, I remember Larry Elmore, the artist, talking about how he would play in a group at TSR where it, it, you never, they didn't trust anybody in the group. And they were always, you know, killing guys and taking their treasure. And they're like, it was, it was really mercenary. Nobody trusted each other. There was always a question if someone would die, whether they even res- resurrected, them, resurrected the character, if they could. Like, there was a lot of just infighting like stuff. Say again? It was like griefers back in the... Yeah, yeah. It was weird. It, so it's the way the game grew up. The funny thing is, it's not as it's commonly played at TSR in particular. Um, it, it was a pretty brutal game, and it was a lot of backstabbing, a very mercenary game. So go figure. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with part two of this interview and of course i'll put links in the show notes to uh, mike's website uh, so you can buy the book there or you can just go of course to amazon and pick it up there uh, he also says it's in barnes and nobles and and uh, regular uh, brick and mortar bookstores i haven't been went to one of those in a while uh, but apparently they are there so go check it out and uh, he also said if you want a signed copy he's happy to accommodate you just go to his website uh, again i'll put links to all this stuff in the show notes uh, as always, I want to thank you, thank you very much for your support of this show. 
uh, keeping episodes like this, interviews with people like Mike Whitwer, uh, on. Uh, I couldn't do it without you guys. And all I ask, if you enjoy these episodes, if you like the show, want to see more, I'll just throw a dollar into the hat. All I ask is a buck an episode, and it's very easy to set that account up. Just go to Patreon, link in the show notes, or to the mattchat.us site. It takes a couple minutes. Uh, if you don't have any money, but you still want to support the show, hey, uh, just tell some friends about it. Go on Facebook, Twitter, uh, whatever you use, YouTube comments, I don't care. Uh, but just let somebody else know about the show, and I greatly appreciate it. All right, what about that news from the Matt Cave? All right, first off, has some really great news. Love that. Uh, Copper Dreams has been successfully funded. You know, I just had Joe and Hannah on uh, last episode, and they were, uh, I was pretty sure they would reach the goal, but they were still a few thousand shy. Uh, well, they've managed not only to reach that goal of 40,000, but to hit 43,000. So really uh, congratulations to them. Uh, over a thousand backers, and really looking forward to the Copper Dreams gig. Uh, also, I wanted to pass this along. I saw this article on Forbes. Uh, this is by Paul Tassi, and the title pretty much tells you everything. Uh, are we all just giving up on split-screen video games? So I thought, <laughs> I hadn't really thought about it before, but it does seem like we don't see as many split-screen games as we used to. Uh, I guess uh, now I don't really play as many uh, games. I don't have as many friends coming over playing games as I did when I was a kid, so maybe I didn't really notice this or pay much attention to it before. Uh, but this article goes into detail about how it's sort of been phased out and how maybe it really shouldn't be phased out, especially now that we have these uh, 4K screens. You know, everybody's got the big giant 4K screens. It would be ideal uh, for a two-way, if not a four-way uh, split screen. Uh, so anyway, I thought that was an interesting article, and I wanted to get your take on it. Of course, everybody's got memories of playing GoldenEye or Mario Kart uh, split screen. I remember also playing one called Sky Chase on the Amiga quite a bit. Uh, but anyway, just let me know what your favorite split screen games are and whether you think they should make a comeback. Uh, okay, and then I got a couple I items here from Stig. Uh, the first is really exciting. This is uh, CinemaWare's games have the rights to those games. So we're talking that came from the desert, Defender of the Crown, and Wings. Uh, a company has bought the rights to those to the tune of 525,000 euros in cash. And what they want to do is make uh, VR experiences at IMAX centers. So you can imagine going to an IMAX center and having some kind of VR experience involving uh, Wings, or I think Wings would be ideal, but uh, Defender of the Crown, I guess we could see how that might work out. Uh, but anyway, that was uh, really interesting. I'm really looking forward to seeing what they come up with. So I'll post a link to that in the show notes. And Stig also wrote in about this program called Launch Box. Now this is a free program. It's a portable box art based, I think that's the key here, uh, games database and launcher. And it works with DOSBox as well as emulators and PC games. So uh, I, you probably use a tool like Defend or uh, maybe uh, there's a couple from MAME. Uh, this product aims to uh, not only bring all those different sort of emulators and systems into one uh, sort of one-stop shop, uh, but it also imports the game uh, art for the boxes, I suppose. Maybe the maybe screenshots, I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, I haven't tried this out yet, but it looks very promising to me. So I thought I would go ahead and pass it on to you guys. Uh, if you're using it, let me know what you think. And I think that will do it for the news. All right. Uh, so what about that ale of the week? Uh, this week I've got another one of the Jackson Hole sodas. This is a Snake River Sarsaparilla. This is an old-fashioned soda made with cane sugar. Best dang soda in the whole darn country, apparently. And, <laughs> and they even got their phone number underneath that claim, so I guess you can call up and argue with them if you disagree. Uh, let's see. Got some good-looking ingredients. This has got some of that quila, quilaya, quila. I never did learn how to pronounce that <laughs> extract in it. And we got a pretty cool old westy, or old western style photo on the cover there. Looks like they got like fishing poles. There's like a couple of ladies with fishing poles on the on the label. Not sure what's going on with that. Apparently they, yeah, here it says, do you have some old frontier family photos? 
want to see them on our labels and packaging. So apparently these are, I guess, fans of the soda. They must have had some old photos. I don't know if these are vintage photos or maybe they went to one of those uh, with the glamour shots. I think we'll do something like this, the old Western photos. Anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this Snake River Sarsaparilla here in the rather excellent drinking horn. Ah, it really smells nice. You can smell it even, even from that far back. You sort of get that, I guess if you haven't had a sarsaparilla, or we say sarsaparilla uh, before, it's kind of like root beer. It's not quite the same, though. I don't really know how to describe that difference. <laughs> it's just different than uh, the standard root beer flavor. Uh, smelling, I guess, smells sort of an anise. That's really about all I smell. It's kind of a nice uh, anise aroma. Uh, so let's give it a taste. Oh, wow. Uh, this pa <laughs> that packs quite a wallop uh, in terms of a body. Very uh, nice thick body on this one. Uh, you get sort of a something going on in your in your nasal cavities when you taste this. It's kind of a peppery like experience. Uh, it's very sweet. I uh, got a nice uh, anise sort of licorice flavor uh, on the back end there. I'll try it again. Yeah, this is uh, really nice actually. It's a little bit kind of a com combination of uh, oh what is it? Any of those little licorice candies? Kind of reminds me of those, uh, but not. Not the sort of soft ones, but those sort of hard candies of the licorice flavor. That's what it's reminding me of. Uh, you get a little bit of an anise flavor there. Um, yeah, anise, licorice, with a little bit of maybe a peppery-like uh, experience. Uh, really interesting. Yeah, I mean, this is a really interesting drink. There's even a little bit of a, a bitterness in there. Just very subtle, but I can just sort of... Taste a faint hint of bitterness there to kind of make it a little bit more complicated of a of a flavor. I'm actually really impressed with this Snake River Sarsaparilla. You know, this is something really different. You can definitely tell this isn't root beer. <laughs> uh, so if you want something uh, uh, that's kind of anise flavored but not root beer flavored, I think you might uh, look for this one. Snake River Sarsaparilla. Uh, I'm gonna go a five out of five on this. You know, I think they, if you know, when I try something like this. I don't want a standard taste and I think they, uh, they they provided something here that's really unusual but very nice. So five out of five drinking horns on this Snake River Sarsaparilla. So let's wrap this up with a quotation and I was looking for quotes about kids and violence and violent stories and the impact of those stories and I came across this one. This is from Politically Correct Bedtime Stories by James Finn Garner. Now, if you're not familiar with this, some people mistakenly think he's being serious about this, but it's actually a satire, and I think it's a, it's a really brilliant one. Uh, but anyway, this is from the Little Red Riding Hood remake, if you will, and it goes something like this. The wolf said, You know, my dear, it isn't safe for a little girl to walk through these woods alone. <laughs> Red Riding Hood said, I find your sexist remark offensive in the extreme, but I will ignore it because of your traditional status as an outcast from society, the stress of which has caused you to develop your own entirely valid world view. Now, if you'll excuse me, I must be on my way. <laughs> Hope you guys enjoyed that and see you next week. To my left, you'll recognize Gary Gygax, inventor of Dungeons & Dragons. Greetings! It's a pleasure to meet you.